Hello, everyone. Mary-Kate Saliva here with you on Veteran Voices for another great episode. Thanks for joining us today as we get ready, or as I should say, I get ready to interview an incredible veteran who's doing great work to give back to the community. Stay tuned for an incredible conversation. And just a quick programming note before we get started. This program is part of the Supply Chain Now family of programming, and today's show in particular is in partnership with Vets to Industry, and that's Vets the number two industry, a nonprofit that's near and dear to my heart that's giving back to veterans and their families. You can learn more about the great work that Vets to Industry is doing at vetstoindustry.org. An initiative that's near and dear to my heart is the Guam Human Rights Initiative. You can learn more about the great work that they're doing at guamhri.org and how they are giving back to the region. And without further ado, I won't delay us any longer. I'm excited to introduce our guest today. Our guest is, a, he's a veteran of the Air Force, and he's also a published author and a retired police sergeant. So I'm really excited to welcome today, Michael Sugru. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Oh, definitely. Thank you for having me on. So I've been wanting to interview for you for a while now. I'll say I just been but you know you you published a book you're you've been super busy and I'm just really grateful for this time that you're taking today and I want to take this opportunity to go a little far back I know that the book that you published is not a biography on yourself so we're going to take this opportunity to get to know you and I was wondering if you could um kick us off first with a motivational quote Absolutely. So this is from Winston Churchill, and it's success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Oh, I love that. Well, that's actually, I think you're the first one to say that one, but why did you end up picking that one? What does that one mean to you? You know, because the thing is, I've, I've been through a lot in my life and through my journey. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of what I do now deals with post-traumatic stress injury, what I like to call it, versus PTSD. Right. And, you know, there's been a lot of ups and downs. There's been a lot of battles. And the key to overcoming this is never giving up, is continuing on. And I think that's important to keep that mindset because, you know, a lot of us, whether we're veterans, first responders, at some point in our personal lives or careers, many of us have hit rock bottom yes. uh, to the point where, you know, some of us just don't want to be here anymore. And that was the case for me is I actually got to that low point where I didn't want to be here anymore. And the fact is that through that fight, I never gave up. I pressed through as hard as it was. And I came out the other side. And today I'm living proof that you can overcome this, that you can get better and that you can win this battle. And so I think it's just really important to remember that, to just, you know, never give up. And it takes more courage than anything to, to not give up and keep the fight. And that's why I'm here today is to talk about that. And I, I really love that you address that quote, but also the meaning behind it, because one of the things that for me is, I know you're a force, but for me as, a, as an army soldier, like one of our mantras about, you know, never leave a fallen comrade and never quit. But I think we think of never quit in the sense of never quitting on our comrades and our, our battle buddies, but not in the sense of quitting on ourselves. Uh, how many of our brothers and sisters have have lost that fight uh, that with their internal demons and left behind a family, left behind loved ones? Um, but it, so that's that they're struggling with. So I'm really grateful that you're going to take the time today to talk about some of that and, and what you've shared in your book. I wanted to take us first a little bit uh, back into, not too far back, but a little bit back into your upbringing. And uh, if you could share with us a bit about where you grew up and, and some, some of those anecdotes from your, your uh, childhood. Absolutely. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was actually born and raised in Oakland and I ended up oh, wow. moving to different cities, you know, within the Bay Area. There's a lot of cities here. And um, to go pretty far back, my parents got divorced when I was about eight years old. And my stepfather came into my life very early, and he was actually in law enforcement. Um, at the time, mm -hmm. he was a police sergeant. He later became a police lieutenant. But he was my ultimate role model. He was my ultimate hero. And I actually got the interest in law enforcement all the way back then at eight years old. And I was actually 
a police volunteer for one of our police departments out here, the Sausalito Police Department. And I remember getting that first laminated ID card, you know, the official card from the police department. And that's just where I felt this sense of belonging, like this sense of family. And mm -hmm. I saw the camaraderie and I saw the friendships and I knew then that that's what I wanted to do. And there's some different things that happened throughout my life that kind of changed my trajectory a little bit, but I was always on a path of service. And if you, you know, fast forward to my high school years, I was actually a police explorer for a different police department, the Richmond Police Department. And my original goal was to go into the FBI. Now, back then, you needed a college degree, but you also needed some kind of work experience in addition to your degree yeah. to go into the FBI. And so what I did was I, I looked into the programs, um, both the Army and the Air Force. And I actually went through the full Army officer course at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I passed that. But the Army didn't want to offer me much in the way of a scholarship to school. So I actually Shame on looked them. Into, I know, right? So I, I looked into the Air Force. And they actually offered me a full scholarship at uh, Sacramento State University here in Northern California. And so my original plan was just to do my four years. That was my, my commitment. And my first choice was security forces because that was as close to the Army as I was going to get in the Air Force. And I also knew that would set me up for a career in law enforcement. And so I graduated in 98, was commissioned a butter bar. And then I started getting the station all over. You know, I went through my security forces training. I ended up in Europe. Um, I was in South America. I was in the Middle East. And what happened was, is, you know, I was going to get on that four-year point. And they offered me Germany. And I was not going to turn down. Oh, how can, you can't. Germany. No, you can't. So <laughs> you can't. That, I was just there actually... for the first time in my life. I was just there a couple weeks ago for the first time ever. Oh, that's amazing. I, I, I really want to go back. It is absolutely amazing there. And so... Because of that, that extended me. And so I stayed in longer. I ended up getting assigned back here in California to Travis Air Force Base in 2003. And then I started applying to civilian law enforcement agencies. Um, I made the decision that federal wasn't really for me. Right. I wanted to be out there doing the hands-on stuff every single day, You know, wearing a uniform, wearing a badge, working here in the Bay Area in a community. And so I ended up getting hired by the Walnut Creek Police Department in 2004. And that started my civilian path in law enforcement. I really love that you you still went full circle, went around the world, could have landed anywhere. And you chose to come back to the community where you grew up and, and where your stepdad planted that seed for you to, to you know, service above self and to wear that uniform, carry that badge and Really thank you in that aspect on both just the military and law enforcement. And I say with like veterans, like while we were serving, we're not carrying a gun every day like law enforcement is. And, and you're facing different kinds of, of enemy, you know, our own fellow American at, oftentimes and just the the threat and the danger that you're facing on the day to day. Um, would, I would love to hear about, as you mentioned about your stepdad, um, for your law enforcement career and even your, your military career, who are some of those um, mentors and sort of some of those lessons learned that you had? Anybody take you under their wing at that time? You know, early on, my grandfather, and he was in the Army Air Corps, he was my first influence into the military. And I remember, you know, going over to his house as a young kid and seeing his uniform and seeing his medals. And mm -hmm. I was just in awe awesome. of that. And, and so, you know, and I dressed up as a soldier or a cop, literally like every single Halloween as a kid. So, I mean, it was just, <laughs> photos. You know, I, <laughs> I know, right. I, I love the uniform. You know, I went into the Cub Scouts and, and did all those things. And, but truly my stepfather, I mean, he would actually come to my high school and he taught, he helped teach one of the criminal justice classes. And he was a homicide detective at the time. And he actually brought in his case binders and showed us photos and crime scenes and talked about, you know, pretty complex homicide investigations. And he, he was the linchpin for me. I mean, I also had an uncle, his brother, who was also in law enforcement. So between the two of them, it was always, you know, hearing their stories and, and listening to their discussions and, Anytime I had any question whatsoever, whether it was a leadership question, whether it was just a, a knowledge question, you know, a factual thing, I would always go to my stepfather and he always knew the answer. I mean, he was a phenomenal man. He was a great leader as well. 
Well, I definitely probably need um, hundreds more like him um, in our country. And so just really, I love that he was there for you and the idea of you just wearing the uniform. I bet he was just proud of you, like, you know, beyond anything. Um, so one of the things with regards to your, it, it seemed like even from an early age, you always wanted to wear the uniform. Now I understand the whole army thing. Cause I always like to ask that about why you ch chose the branch that you did. Uh, shame on you army for those of you out there offer better options and scholarship <laughs> options to those interested in the army. Um, since I am army and I'm going to be biased. But I do want to note, because I think you're the, the first um, guest that I've had on Veteran Voices that really talked about kind of the the history aspect that, you know, that your grandfather served. Um, one of the things that I love, actually, this picture behind me is from an ancestor of mine that fought in the Civil War. And I really love being able to trace back lineage. And I think it's so important to be able to keep our our ancestors' stories alive and, and those veteran stories of those from pre previous wars. So I love that your grandfather actually had that out, like the medals for you to see and, and his awards for you to see. Because I know some veterans, they just lock all that stuff away and they don't want to affiliate and associate as a veteran. Um, but I really want to hear about from where you said you went, Germany, obviously a highlight there. But can you talk a little bit about the security forces and, and maybe some highlight there for you in your career, what it was kind of like a, a pivotal point for you. Um, you know, there's a couple different ones I can think of, but first off, and at the time I honestly didn't realize how good of assignment was, but my first official security forces duty assignment was in Cheyenne at FU Warren Air Force Base. And I was a flight leader. Um, I had, I think my first flight had close to 40 people in it. And we are actually in charge of protecting the ICM, ICBM sites where the nuclear missiles launch out of the ground, both in Wyoming and Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And so I would go out for a few days at the time with my teams and I would have, you know, four to five different sites where my troops would be deployed to. And I would go out and do site visits and, you know, stay overnight and do exercises. And, but, you know, I had complete autonomy out there. Literally, I was the flight commander i was the one in charge i was out there interacting with the troops i mean every single day all day long i wasn't stuck in an office i wasn't doing paperwork well, that's how you doing... wanted it to be though right you wanted to be oh, out, out absolutely <laughs> yeah you know i was wearing the uniform i mean i had an m4 i think we had 210 rounds you know that we carried on our lbe and i was just out there every single day and i loved it and you know that was part of the thing too is that when you go in as a lieutenant you know, initially you get to do a lot of the hands-on things, but as you progress in rank, it's less hands-on and it's more administration, more command, more planning. And, and literally my heart was always in doing the work and being out there. Um, I can remember shortly after that at the same base, I got transitioned to law enforcement where mm -hmm. I ran a law enforcement flight where, you know, we respond to like 911 calls to alarms. We did traffic stops. We did all the criminal type stuff. And then I also was in charge of the weapon storage area, which is where they kept the nuclear missile heads on base. But I remember getting in trouble with my commander because I was out there running LIDAR and radar as the lieutenant, pulling people over and writing tickets. And I mean, I just, I <laughs> love it. You're not enjoying that, writing tickets out? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but... you know, I, I hate to say it, but I really love giving tickets. And, um, you know, that's that's one of the things the I record. miss. I, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I called I it touching lives back then. Touching. Oh, okay. That's one for the books right there. Touching lives. I, I, there's actually a place in Virginia where they call it the million dollar mile because I heard the law enforcement unit gets like a million dollars annually just from pulling people over on speeding <laughs> tickets. There's like one stretch on this one road in Virginia that as soon as you see people hit that, the brake lights come on and uh, gosh, no mercy. So well, with that being said, that's pretty exciting. And I love that you actually wanted to be out there. So it really speaks volumes to to you as a person and just want it very much forward facing and being with people and being able to protect people. Um, if, if you I would love to hear sort of that that transition, because um, we just talked about like the the excitement and the good stuff. Um, but you as you mentioned earlier about post traumatic stress, there's obviously like 
a turning point at some point or maybe an accumulation of things that have happened. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind just walking through that part and that turning point in your life. Absolutely. And for me, you know, and I'll just be upfront is that my post-traumatic stress injury is all from my civilian law enforcement career. Oh, and it's wow. not from the military. Um, even though I was in South America, I was in the Middle East and, you know, I did a lot of things, but my post-traumatic stress is from civilian law enforcement. And before I talk about a particular incident, which really kind of changed everything for me and changed my life, um, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but the general public doesn't really look at law enforcement as being in combat, right? But if you take a typical, let's say, military soldier, no matter what your branch is, usually you may have a couple deployments, some go to combat zones. The ones that do, you know, you're in a defined hostile area for a set period of time. You yes. may do that one, two, maybe three, four times in your career and you're coming back home. And, you know, when you're off duty, you're off duty. But the thing is, is in civilian law enforcement, you know, we're literally in combat every single day. And that's for up to 30 years at a time. There is no downtime. There is no. <laughs> you know, not... Sorry about that. No worries. I'll start. I'll start again. So there is no downtime. You know, you're you're on constant alert, whether you're on duty, off duty. There's a constant threat. And we don't know who the threat is. That's the thing is that when you're in combat, you generally know who the enemy is. You know where the enemy's at. And for us, we could literally be on a coffee break, on a meal break, and somebody could come in and decide to gun us down. Or, you know, on the million traffic stops that I did or pedestrian stops, we don't know if they're wanted for murder, if they're on parole or probation, if they're armed. Right. We don't know their status. But my point is that every single contact, every single call for service, every single person that we contact is a potential lethal threat to us. And so that's just something that I want listeners to keep in mind is that it's not generally accepted, you know, for first responders and law enforcement in particular to have post-traumatic stress injury. You know, the public widely accepts that the military, that many members in the military will or have had post-traumatic stress injury, but they don't equate the same to all first responders. And I'm talking about firefighters, paramedics, dispatchers and law enforcement in my case. So that's such a great, great point about all first responders, because it, when you think about what even just seeing a, seeing a body, seeing the scene, the crime scene it can be can impact them in a negative way or impact them in some way, um, whether they know the person or not. So there's like, I think you're right. When we think about post-traumatic stress, we think about and I think about this even with veterans, when I talk to civilians, they think like we all go to Afghanistan or we all went to the Middle East. And that's not even the case. Um, as you know, we end up deploying in all different places. We get stationed in different places, but we're not facing that that combat, that combat environment on a day to day like law enforcement, like first responders who are working on holidays, who are working no matter what the weather is um, and having to make these split second decisions. Uh, that could impact not only their life or their teammates, but also those that they're trying to um, help and serve. So, gosh, and with regards to to that, um, yes, I'd love to hear about a little bit more about that post-traumatic stress. At the, I, I have to ask, though, you mentioned about like not wanting to say the D in the disorder, and I noticed that that's, that also some folks or listeners may not understand about that, but was that something you always knew or where did you learn that and come to a conclusion about not adding it as, as D with disorder? So I didn't, you know, invent the term or come up with it, but I've been using it for several years and there's a couple different reasons why. And the first reason is that that word disorder has a very negative connotation to it. And, you know, nobody wants to have a disorder be labeled as having a disorder because right. that's a negative thing. It's a bad thing. And you feel like you have no control over it. There's nothing you can do about it. And so just that simple word from disorder to injury, that can prevent people from asking for help, for acknowledging that they're having issues. But the real reason I use the word injury is because it is a proven fact that when somebody has repeated exposure to trauma, there are physical and chemical changes in the human brain that take place. It's a fact. You know, they've done tons of brain scans, brain imaging, showing people, you know, before post-traumatic stress, or after an incident, and you can truly see the changes in the brain. 
And, you know, in law enforcement and the military, firefighters, the same, we deal with a lot of physical injuries, you know, bum knees, bad backs, bad shoulders. And we have no problems, you know, saying, hey, look, I, I can't take this anymore. My, my back is killing me. I've got to do something about this. You know, I need to go see a doctor maybe go to physical therapy or maybe take some medications to treat my back. But right. why don't we do the same when it comes to a mental injury, you know, an injury to the brain. And we need to look at it as the same because being exposed to trauma is part of our job. You know, as first responders, we're exposed to hundreds and hundreds of traumatic incidents over our careers. And that is going to affect us. And we can either do what I did for many years and many people do is we can pretend like I'm invincible. You know, I'm Superman. Nothing bothers me. Nothing phases me. And so I'm just going to be detached. I'm going to put everything away. I'm not going to internalize everything. But the facts are, is that we're human. And, and the things that we see, like even just, you know, really bad car accidents or fatal car accidents, suicides, you know, homicides, even just natural deaths. I can't tell you how many just natural deaths that I've been to, but just to see repeated dead bodies over time is going to take a toll on you. And so yes. we need to bring down this curtain and, and just talk about this stuff. We don't have to make it a big deal, but acknowledge it, you know, acknowledge when something's messed up, acknowledge when something's bothering us or having an effect on us and just being able to have a, a trusted conversation with somebody, whether that's a peer or a professional where we can just open up a little bit and just talk about it. like, Hey, you know what? I, I'm not sleeping good right now. I have this constant image in my head of that bad accident we went to a couple of days ago and I can't stop thinking about it. And so I, I need to talk about that instead of just internalizing it. Um, but what we do do is we joke about things and mm -hmm. we call it gallows humor where we just kind of brush it off and we laugh it off and, you know, just, it doesn't bother me and we just move on to the next thing, but, but it is taking a toll. That's the facts. Gosh, and I and I really appreciate your explanation to that because I think that prior to me joining the military, that wasn't like something I learned about in high school. It wasn't something even in my early career in the army. I didn't really know anything about post traumatic stress, what it was, what that injury. You know, to me, it was just like concussions, and you know, in, but not not about feelings or talking about feelings or who to go to to share about those feelings. And one of the interesting things that you were talking about um, in that comparison about how you got um, post-traumatic stress injury from your law, civilian law enforcement as opposed to your career in the military, I was thinking about how we stress so much just as a society about supporting veterans in their transition. Um, but we have veterans, you're a veteran, you could have served one contract, 20-year contract or plus that. But like you said, with law enforcement career up to like 30 years, and I find that a lot of law enforcement units, you end up retiring just in that, staying in that community because the way the retirement systems are different. But what was that transition period like for you? Um, you know, in comparison to what we do in the military, all that support, talking to them about going to the VA, getting medical, is does law enforcement have go through that or first responders in general about having that support and transition? You know, things are a lot better now than when I first started, but I can tell you that, you know, when I went through the police academy, which is, you know, similar like boot camp for the military, we didn't have any speakers come in or any discussions on the toll of the job, you know, on the mm -hmm. trauma that we're truly going to see and how it's going to affect our physical health, our mental health, how it's going to affect our relationships, our marriages, you know, our friendships. We didn't talk about that stuff. You know, we trained on the exciting things like how to shoot guns, drive cars fast, you know, arrest control techniques, um, defensive tactics. We learned the law. We learned how to document things. And we did learn about outside mental illness, you know, as far as how to deal with people on the street when they're in crisis or when they're having issues. So we do receive training in that regard. But like you said earlier, even in the military, we don't train to take care of ourselves. And, and here's the sad fact is that for both the military and all first responders, we are much more likely to die by our own hands than the hands of another. That is a fact. You know, you can take the entire Vietnam War and you can take all the soldiers that died in that conflict. But if you take the number of soldiers that died after that conflict and the one that took their own lives, that the numbers are far greater. 
And you can do the same year over year when you talk about law enforcement, line of duty deaths. That's where it's considered, you know, dying on the job or as a result of the job. You know, suicide far outnumbers that. And so we are our own greatest risk. Yet we don't spend our resources and our time training for that and talking about it. And so, you know, agencies have come out with things like peer support teams. Um, They have contracted therapists who are, I call, culturally competent. Those are people who, you know, only work with first responders. They get us just like you need special therapists and clinicians that work with military members because they need to know the uniqueness of our professions, of the things that we see and the things that we deal with. And so, and even back when I went through my things, you know, my agency had a lot of these programs. We had peer support people, we had annual training, we had people come in and talk, but, you know, I didn't trust that system. I didn't trust the people on the peer support team. I didn't have established relationships with therapists or clinicians or people that I could go to. So I kept everything inside and literally felt like I was on an island. I felt like there's nobody out there who would understand what I was feeling, who would truly get, you know, the thoughts that I was having. But in reality, you know, going forward now with everything I've been through and all the volunteer work that I do, you know, I'm not unique or special. And there's countless of my brothers and sisters who are going through the same things, who have the same thoughts that are having the same struggles. And it's much more common than we think or that we talk about. And that's what this is all about is just shedding light on the reality of it. You know, bringing it down. Do you still see a a stigma in society as far as fearing those who are diagnosed with PTS? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that there's an absolute stigma. It's It's a negative stigma. Um, you know, I know when I, when you watch the news, if there's any kind of active shooter situation or like mass casualty thing, the first thing everybody says is, oh, they must have PTSD or they must have post-traumatic stress. And, and it just really angers me when I hear that because, you know, so many people deal with post-traumatic stress and not just people in the military or in law enforcement, but everyday people. I mean, you know, you look at like, I don't want to get off topic here, but Females in the military, one of the biggest sources of PTS is sexual assault. I mean, that is a fact for for female military members, you know, and that's not talked about, you know, but out there on the street, same thing. You know, we've got tons of gun violence. We've got people growing up in inner cities that are seeing their friends literally getting killed right in front of them, you know, and so everyone, I mean, I don't want to say everyone has post-traumatic stress because they don't, but everyone deals with trauma at some point people are going to have a traumatic incident in their life, you know, maybe one, maybe two, but for us as first responders, we've got hundreds and hundreds, you know, the personal ones, but on top of the work ones, we get both. Uh, and I, and I appreciate that you said that because I was even thinking about what you said about the, the active shooters. And we talked about even nine 11, like those who survived those you know, active shooting incidences or even survivors from a, a car accident, you know, with the multi-car pile up. And it, it, there's all these different things that we can experience as civilians, no matter what age group. But that's something that even just in my lifetime of, or I should say in my youth, that I don't recall ever being talked about, about handling that kind of trauma that in an emotion that stems from trauma um handling your emotions yes you know like anger management yes maybe but not so much specifically on that trauma that's something that we just continue to bury deep because you're absolutely right there is that stigma and i still know brothers and sisters of mine that don't want to go to medical they don't want to log anything because they want to do federal law enforcement or a FBI or something after their military career, and they don't want that to be a, a black mark on their record as they think it will be. Um, they think that they won't be able to, to have their guns. They think their guns will be taken away from them. Um, they, you know, all these different things, they say just snowballs into what they think of being affiliated with having a disorder, so to speak. Um, and I also get upset about that too. If there is an active shooter incident and that person's a veteran, even if they say like 20 years ago, they're going to slap veteran in the headline, you know, to say like air force veteran murdered. So, and so somebody or X number of people. Um, so in that we're just, again, just amplifying that negative stigma that we have in our society. 
So with regards to, um, I guess to transitioning a little bit just in your book, you know, there's, I'd say like folks like me, we think about writing a book someday, but we don't actually do it. We haven't done it. Uh, you went about taking something that you ex yourself have experienced, possibly continue to experience, and you wrote a book. But would you mind sharing a, a bit about what prompted you to, to write your your story or write this book? Absolutely. So the book is uh, Relentless Courage, Winning the Battle Against Frontline Trauma. And I'll just be honest with you from the start. And it's I owe this all to Dr. Shauna Springer. Um, also known as Doc Springer. She's my co-author. She's a clinical psychologist. She has worked with combat veterans and first responders most all her career. She worked for the VA. Mm -hmm. She worked for TAPS. And she truly gets it. She's one of those culturally competent clinicians that I told you about earlier. She understands us. She's, you know, one of us. She she has our back. And so um, it it's kind of a long story, but I'm going to try to make it short. So before COVID happened, she actually reached out to me kind of like out of the blue on LinkedIn. Um, I have a big social media presence and I was always posting things on there about suicide prevention, post-traumatic stress. And we just set up a phone call and we started talking and she was telling me about the work that she's doing now um, with stellate ganglion block, which is actually a medical procedure to treat the physical symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And mm. then she was asking me, you know, like, you know, what's your story, you know, what, what, what's your background? And so I went into debt with her and told her my trauma stories. And after we had that discussion, she, she straight up asked me, she's like, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, well, I've actually been asked that before and I have thought about it. But to be honest with you, I said, I'm so just burnt out from post-traumatic stress and from 20 plus years of report writing and documenting things that I honestly don't think I have the focus, concentration and the patience to get a book done. And so we kind of left our conversation at that. A couple months later, she reaches back out to me. We have another phone call. Now we haven't even met in person at this point. This is all just on the phone. It's incredible. And she's and amazing. It is. And, and everything <laughs> happens for a reason. So, and she says, look, she's like, you know, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of trauma stories. She's like, but your story, it's staying with me. And, I, and she said, I think it's really, it's going to help countless people. So many people are going to be able to resonate with your story and we can save lives with this. And so she's like, I want to make this happen for you. And so we literally embarked on this journey. Now we're talking about the beginning of COVID. And so we literally had zoom meetings every week, like two hours long where I was discussing everything. I mean, all the way back to childhood until now. And the book has a very, very unique format that I don't think has been done anywhere else. And that's what makes this book so powerful. So there's about 15 chapters. Um, the first part of every chapter is my story told in my voice. Um, so, you know, stories from childhood, stories in the military, stories of, you know, trauma that I faced on the streets and law enforcement, and then how that affected my family, um, how it affected my health, all of that. I mean, no holds barred. I mean, literally, I bear my soul in this book. And then Doc Springer comes in at the end of every chapter, and she breaks it down and explains everything in a global sense so that everybody reading this book, whether you're a first responder, military, a family member one, or if you're just somebody on the street that doesn't even know any first responders or military, you are now going to see the true human side behind the badge and behind the uniform. And you're going to see the true toll that our professions take on us. And in this book, the whole purpose, it's to save lives. It's to stop these suicides. But the other amazing thing that this book has done, and I've already seen it and I've heard from several people, is that it's helping to bridge that community gap between the law enforcement specifically and the communities they serve. And it's letting them see us in a different light. It's letting them see us as the humans that we truly are and, and let them see that, yeah, this stuff affects us, that we care, you know, but we still go out there every single day willing to put that badge and gun on, putting our lives on the line for complete strangers, knowing every single day we might not even come back home to our own spouses and our own children. We're willing to do that day in and day out for 30 plus years. And so this book, it is powerful, absolutely powerful, but it's got solutions. It's got resources. 
in the back of the book, we have a whole section with vetted resources, you know, for firefighters, police officers, dispatchers, you know, some are retreats, some are inpatient programs, some are just hotlines and text lines, but this book is already changing and saving lives. Well, thank you for doing that. Thank you for taking up, um, you know, Dr. Shauna Springer's um, advice about having the book, writing the book, sharing your story and being vulnerable and open to the community because your story needs to be told and others need to be able to understand and help bridge that gap. I like I think back to my own childhood. I remember sometimes seeing law enforcement out and about in the community um, but I've definitely seen a bigger shift, a greater involvement of law enforcement in the community, talking to kids so kids aren't scared of the police and and uh, engage in the community so that we're not scared when when law enforcement comes around and that we feel like you are out there, um, you know, and that you're our society's heroes. So I really appreciate you helping to bridge that gap. Um, really love the fact that you said that it helps to the community to better understand, because I think it does work two ways. I think we expect so much from our law enforcement first responders put you on this pedestal of perfection that you must know what you're doing and be right at all times. Uh, but that's not the case. Like you said you are human. You have families to go home to every night. And and for many of my friends who are law enforcement I've spoken to, there's no like turning on and off the switch as much as we try. Like you, you are have your head on a swivel at all times, you you know, where the exits are at. This isn't something like your training where you're like, I'm just going to put that to bed now and, and just be a normal, as you say, normal person. Um, you have specialized training. So with regards to the, the book, um, is this something that you've been able to share? Like you find that it's reaching audiences all over the country? Well, it's actually all over the world. So we've actually all over sold the world. That's and- incredible. Yeah, in five different countries. Um, it's been out for, I believe, 23 weeks now, and it's been a bestseller for almost all of that time. Um, we've already gotten, I think we're up to 226 reviews on Amazon. And many of the people that are writing these reviews, I mean, they're writing like three, four, five paragraphs where they're they're literally putting it out there and, and they're they're sharing the impact that this book has had on them. And that that's what keeps me going is the messages that I get from people seeing the reviews, you know, having people reach out to me. And the the common thing I hear is me too. Oh, me too. Me too. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, I'm not unique and I'm not special. And the things that I talk about in this book, they're not unique and special. And so many people are going to be able to relate to this book. And like I said, not, not just first responders, not just service members, but everyone is going to be able to relate to this book. It's going to resonate with them. And, and it's, it's just, it's unbelievable how this happened. I mean, I never envisioned it. And, you know, I truly believe that everything happens for a reason. And this is my calling now. This is my purpose in life. Um, I am fully retired from law enforcement. I medically retired in 2018 for post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. And so now, you know, addition to the book is I do national speaking. I speak across the country to both the military and to first responders where I'm just sharing my story in the hopes that it will allow people to see that they're not alone, that there is hope and that there is help and and that I'm living proof that you can get through this. Well, I thank you for that message. And for our listeners, please get in contact because get Michael on your schedule and, and, and invite out, invite Michael out to speak. Um, Really appreciate your message. And, and now you have me just thinking about that with regards to the transition again. If you had any sort of advice to those going through their transition right now, if you were to speak to a room of transitioning first responders, transitioning uh, service members that are stepping in and hanging up that uniform for the last time, what would you say to them? Well, I mean, here, here's the reality of it, is that a lot of us, both military and first responders, we've made our careers our number one priority, and we've neglected our families, our children, our loved ones. And my advice to you is to start, it's never too late to start today and start making your family and your loved ones, your children, your spouses, your partners, the number one priority, you know communicate, open that door, have discussions about 
how things are affecting you because I didn't have those discussions and it cost my marriage. You know, I, I made an early on decision that I would keep work separate from my personal life. I wouldn't bring it home. I wouldn't discuss it because that was my way of protecting my family. But the truth of it was, is that when I came home pissed off and her bad mood, I didn't communicate. And so my family thought it was them. They didn't understand that it was the job. They didn't understand that it was the horrific things that I saw that day or the day before that literally were just taking a toll on me. And I, and I wanted to isolate. I wanted to be alone. And so open those doors of communication, start talking, start planning. But, you know, the facts are, it's a job. I mean, for me, it was a calling and I know it's a profession and it's a calling for most of us. And you can still give, you know, 110% at work, but you need to give that same effort or more when you go home every single day. That is the priority. That's what's going to matter is having a life outside the job, outside of work. That's what's going to make the transition the easiest and the smoothest is having a purpose outside of your work, you know, finding purpose within your own family. I'm, I'm just about speechless after that. I, that one really hits home for me. I think uh, one of the, I know you're, you're, we were throwing out stats earlier, but one of the things that I remember seeing, especially for women service, female service members is that, that sense of feeling like what we were doing on active duty or in uniform isn't nearly as like high speed or badass for like a better terms as what we're doing in the civilian and whether that's being a, a mom you know we have I have a lot of friends who are stay-at-home moms and and that's a extremely rewarding job but when they're thinking about like what they did on their deployment or what they did in service um it, and and trying to even process and comparing that uh it it doesn't hold a light to it. So you're absolutely right in bringing that home of just being able to open those lines of communication because we'll find that our loved ones, our inner circle are much more supportive and able to handle it than we think. Or than we, we, get, we don't give them the benefit of the doubt. We don't want to share it with them because we want to protect them, but they, they are the rock. <laughs> they are the ones that, that want to, you know, open their arms to us, even if we just need to, to cry or just let it out. And, and I've done that. Um, it, it was interesting when you said that you, you and, uh, and Dr. Springer had met in person right away. Uh, that was something that I find that some of my mentors, I have never met in person, but I met them during my transition from active duty and I have poured my heart and soul out to them. And there were just some days where we're like, we just needed somebody else who understood where we were coming from to just start breaking down that wall and, and just being able to open up. So that's really, really powerful. Um, gosh, it's like that message alone, like I said, just, I still feel like I'm transitioning and that really hits, resonates with me. Um, if, if you could share a little bit about um, what you have going on next, what do you, what do you have planned coming up? Uh, I'd love to hear what, you, what you've got in store and we should probably keep an eye on, on your LinkedIn account and what you're up to. Well, you know, it's funny you said it earlier, but my main priority is being a stay-at-home dad. So, I mean, I have my oh, daughter. I love that. <laughs> She's only 12. You know, I drive her to school, pick her up. I go to her volleyball games and that is my priority. And so um, I've made a clear line, like balancing what's important and what's more important. And so I do speak, but I try to limit that to four to five times a year and that's it. Um, you know, I've got a speaking engagement coming up in Kansas in February. It's a right. statewide gang investigators association conference. Um, I'm doing a book signing in a couple of weeks. So I do do speaking. I do book signings. But again, my focus is at home. It's my daughter. It's enjoying life. It's literally embracing the things that I never took the time to enjoy because I was so focused on work and my career. So there are no immediate plans for a book or anything like that. Um, I did take part in a documentary film that's going to be coming out eventually. I don't know the release date, but it's called Residual. And that's a, a short documentary film with a bunch of different first responders um, talking about pretty much what you and I are talking about. And that's the effects of the job on our health, on our mm -hmm. personal lives, and then the solutions more importantly. So uh, my plan is just to continue on this path. And to, to touch people, to speak to people, um, I am available if people want to reach out to me. You did mention LinkedIn. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. I've got pages called Sergeant Michael Segru on both platforms. 
And then I also run a page called First Responders First, which mm -hmm. also encompasses military and service members. And I have a private Facebook group with that same name. And those are platforms where we're always sharing things about resilience, suicide prevention, mental health, um, post-traumatic growth, what I like to call it, but just lots of great resources. And so I encourage people to find those, to reach out. They can send me a message. I check those every single day. And I mean, gosh, how humbling is that? Like in, in anybody's eyes, you're absolute hero, rock star. Um, so, and, and the fact that you can say so easily, you know, my daughter comes first as, as she should. And so being able to say like, it doesn't have to come with like a combat helmet and a rifle and, or even holding a gun and, and kicking down doors, you know, just remembering what's really important in life. And, and just for our listeners, one of the things I remember when the American Sniper movie came out, um, myself and a fellow, several other soldiers went to go see that. And a couple of our soldiers who I know have purple hearts, um, it wasn't the aspect of in, in the movie where he was deployed. That wasn't the part that got to them. They actually got up in the middle of the movie at the part with his, um, the scene with his family and with his spouse and how hard it was um, for him to integrate and, and that struggle. And that is what broke them into tears and, and why they couldn't sit through the whole film. And that was, I remember that first point as a, as a young soldier and seeing that, that these grown men like in tears and it wasn't the fact that of the combat side, it was the the family piece that really uh, uh, tore through them. So just remembering again of just what's important in life. And I'm really grateful for your time today and sharing that. Uh, is are any anything that I missed or anything last, last words that you wanted to say? Uh, the last thing I want to say is just know that if you are struggling, if you are having issues that you aren't alone, I assure you that there's countless brothers and sisters out there who have or are going through the same things that you are that have had the same feelings. And I want you to know that there are resources. There are many different things that can help. For me, it was a combination of things. It wasn't just one magic thing. And so you're going to have to try different things. It does take work. It does take patience. But I assure you, there is help. And more importantly, there is hope. And there's a whole new life to live on the other side of this. Thank you so much. Uh, definitely powerful words, a powerful message. And to know our brothers and sisters that are tuning in today that well, regardless of your profession, if they, you have experienced some trauma, you think you may have post-traumatic stress, that you are not alone in this fight. Thank you so much, Michael, for your time. And on behalf of the entire team here at Veteran Voices, really thank you for your work, for being vulnerable, for and showing your strength in, in a way that's I, I think is really beautiful and you're helping people and impacting lives all around the world. We invite you all our listeners today to find us uh, wherever you can subscribe and get your podcast from. And a big thank you to our partners at Vets to Industry. And this is Mary Kate Saliva wishing you all, all of our listeners an incredible week. Stay motivated, do good, give forward and be the change that's needed. Just like the change that, that Michael's been for so many of us. And on that note, we will see you next time. Take care.